So, hello everyone. End of the day, everyone is tired. I will try to be a little bit entertaining. So I'm from Aberdeen. And uh, actually, actually, this talk came after a good number of very interesting talk, which raised a little bit of discussion. Particularly, uh, Andrea's talk the other day, Andrea Cavagna's talk, uh, met some interesting reaction. And uh, this is something to do probably with the hubris of physicists. And uh, the question it raised is, uh, is universality of any use in biology? Actually, I'm a physicist, so I think yes. As a matter of fact, uh, the kind of university I'm going to talk about is basically also what, uh, uh, in a sense, Hugues Chatet discussed earlier today. So it has nothing to do directly with the presence of a critical phase transition. It's more due to the kind of emerging uh, large-scale properties of, system, of a wide number of systems, which basically depends uh, on uh, uh, symmetry and conservation laws and other very general properties of a system, dimensionality, and so on and so forth. And uh, exactly as you uh, anticipated and discussed, uh, this is in a very similar situation of what you encounter when you try to describe the dynamic of fluids in more traditional physical setups, okay? So uh, my idea is that, uh, first of all, as we, it has been told, it justifies the use of very simple models which capture this kind of symmetries and conservation laws to describe obviously much complex system, much more complex system. And, it, and by this kind of universal concept, we can be sure to a certain degree that at least some large scale properties are captured by this kind of systems. Of course, Biology is also interested in a lot of uh, small-scale details, and there is where we cannot be sure that uh, this kind of approach can give uh, any meaningful answer. So this is not obviously solving all the problems of biology. But I believe that uh, can it be at least be used to extract uh, some kind of inf useful information from data. And this is what I'm going to show you with one example, actually. It's, this is ongoing work, so it's not finished. We still miss uh, uh, some experimental validation, for instance, but uh, we'd like to discuss this. So the idea is uh, collective motion. We've been speaking a lot about collective motion. Here you have four different examples, starling flocks, uh, a herd of uh, sheep, uh, fishes, and uh, the embryogenesis uh, in uh, a zebrafish embryo, okay? They all involve uh, migration of a large number of individuals. And uh, one may answer, I mean, a very natural, one way, let me pose it before answering, before I inside the question, a very natural question is, uh, are these uh, kind of collective motion where obviously there is some kind of interaction between the individual, and typically it's a short range interaction between the individual involved. But it's totally spontaneous, or there is also some kind uh, of uh, external guidance of some kind of informal individuals which know where they're going, okay? This was, for instance, the problem that Offer discussed a few days ago concerning ants. So when the ants, the ants forage and they, they find some piece of food, do they know where we have to go back? And uh, how do we, can you understand if they know where is their nest, but it could also be a problem when you study the migration of large animal groups. Are they going with a precise direction in mind, which can be dictated by a lot of different factors, some individuals knowing where to go, magnetic field for, for migrating birds, configuration of the terrain, and so on and so forth, or they're just picking a direction somehow at random. They find an internal consensus, there is nothing outside their group telling where to go, and then they go for a stroll, like they want to have some leisure. Like it's probably the, the case of the birds of uh, Irene and Andrea and many other people. Uh, another example where this kind of question is very relevant, I've been discussing with Kizayer and his collaborators in Dundee, they study 
cellular migration in embryogenesis and uh, the primitive streak formation in many embryos, particularly they study the chick embryo, involves uh, large scale, highly coordinated flows, which involves 10 to the size of more cells. They believe, and there are some indications that this is driven by some kind of external field, chemiotactic, chemiotactic field, mechanotactic uh, effects, and so on and so forth. But the question, okay, this is an example. Let's see if it goes. This is some imaging from a paper of the Dundee group, and, and you can see large migration flow here, so also on the boundary of the embryo. And uh, this flow basically creates uh, the primitive streak, which uh, is basically underlies the, the, the symmetry and, and the chordal spine of, of many, many, uh, basically all uh, vertebrates. So the question is, uh, how can you tell in all of these cases uh, if uh, your collective motion is spontaneous or not, or there is something which is driving it? Okay, one of course can, can look at the, the time series of, of the orientation, so I can look where the group is going, uh, and we know that uh, if, uh, I mean, this is basically what, what Offer was doing, uh, that uh, if you look so at the direction where you're pointing, that the angle which defines the direction in which you're moving into dimension for simplicity, if you're not directed by any external field, is going to perform a random walk, a persistent random walk with a certain length. And so one can think that in the other case, otherwise your animals, your particles know where they go, and so you expect them to fluctuate less. And, and in, indeed, uh, here there are two cases. Uh, they are taken out of a simple Vichek model. You've seen it many times. So you can see immediately, these are time series of the angle, how the angle changes in time. So here I have a checking the quantity for 100,000 time steps, a lot. There are two different cases. I can tell you one came uh, from a directed motion where there is an external direction which came on top of interaction between your particle, and the other, it's a totally free case where the particle self-organized without any external. So you can e easily, I mean, each of you can tell, okay, this will be the free case and this will be the one with an external imposition where basically you don't turn a lot. But then suppose that you don't have access on such a long time series, you start to look at the thing uh, on 10 times shorter time scale. This is the same time series, but just cut it much earlier. Um, you can start to doubt which is the correct one. Then you go 100 times shorter, you wonder which is the directed and which is uh, spontaneous. Not totally sure, you can of course zoom, and you, maybe you can get some idea. You can use a little bit more refined techniques like, uh, like autocorrelation function of your time series, which I'm showing here. But you see basically that when you go to short time scale, it became uh, not totally trivial to distinguish between these two cases. And there is even a worse scenario where I'm not giving you two cases where I tell you this is spontaneous and this is directed. I just have one set of data and I have to decide if it's spontaneous or not. And remember also that uh, the kind of diffusion in a group of uh, N individuals, which perform spontaneous uh, collective motion, decreases with the number of individuals in the group. So uh, the kind of noise becomes, in a sense, smaller and smaller, the kind of meandering and the persistent length grows. So on short time scale is really difficult to tell the difference. There is an alternative way which came from statistical physics and this is what I'm going to discuss here. And it's again based on the study of uh, correlation function between fluctuation. So the main claim which I try to convince you is that the nature of correlation between fluctuations Equal time correlation. So here I'm talking about just looking at how a fluctuation in velocity or in the density at a certain point in your system correlates at the same time with another fluctuation at a distance r, okay? Now the nature of this correlation is radically different between the case of spontaneous collective motion and the case of collective motion which is directed. In principle, if you have a system large enough, 
and you're careful enough, uh, you can be able to detect uh, this kind of difference uh, without accessing to a very long time series, basically looking at a few frames of your system. And this is a claim that which is, could, be, could turn out to be a powerful method to analyze data and to distinguish between the two cases, spontaneous and driven collective motion. Okay, now the story gets a little bit technical. I will try to keep uh, some kind of not too complicated level due to, to the hour. The idea, you have already seen this kind of idea. When you, I start with spontaneous symmetry breaking. So there is nothing in the world which tells the group where they have to go. They just choose themselves. They talk one with each other locally. So they talk with their neighbors. They try to, for instance, like birds, to align their velocities. And then they pick up a random one direction, OK? And this is what physicists call spontaneous symmetry breaking of a continual symmetry. I don't know why there is a written transition there. Sorry, mistake. Um, that's spontaneous symmetry breaking. Not a continuous symmetry. So you have already seen this, this drawing in many of this talk. Basically, what happens is that since every direction is equivalent, uh, once uh, your bursts, your, your particles pick up a direction, it doesn't cost basically nothing to change a little bit. And when there is a little bit of a fluctuation which brings you aside, nothing tells you this is wrong. Since you don't know where you have to go, you're just going around in some direction. This fact uh, turns into the fact that uh, the system is neutral towards this mass fluctuation. So you have basically this extremely long range correlation which emerge in your system, which you've seen in a lot of this, this talk. I mean, this is something basically you cannot escape if you have spontaneous collective motion. And this is true in a basically all system you can think of where you have uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking of this continuous symmetry and where there is nothing uh, to tell you where to go. Okay, another peculiarity, which I'm going to use in, in this method I'm proposing, is that in these systems, uh, the uh, relative position of particles, of neighbors, of, of beasts, uh, of cells, actually is coupled to the fluctuation. Since they move, uh, so if there is a fluctuation locally, it can make two, two cells diverge or two cells converge. So there is a coupling between uh, the velocity and the density. So it turns out that this coupling makes it also density fluctuation became long range. Okay? You can wonder, you can wonder why uh, it's so interested in density fluctuation, but the point is that uh, I think uh, density fluctuation are easier to measure. I mean, to measure velocity fluctuations, to measure velocity in the system, you need a little bit of tracking. Maybe not a very long trajectory, but you need to identify, for instance, where you're the bird you have at time t goes after some milliseconds or some time anyhow. And this is not totally trivial, while it's much easier to just find where in each snapshot of your experiment where particles are without knowing where they are going to be after a little bit. So in a sense, density are, are easier. Okay, of course, this theory has been worked out uh, more than 20 years ago now. I'm going to give a brief overlook, but first, the consequences. You have already seen these uh, uh, kind of experimental data, which came from uh, Irene Giardina groups in Rome. Uh, it basically tells one of the consequences I told you is that uh, the correlation between velocity fluctuations, for instance, in a flock of birds, if there is spontaneous motion, should be scale free, which means that the correlation length is basically as large as the system size, so it grows with the system size. There is not a finite correlation length, okay? And this is a proof that this kind of universality applies to birds. There is a word of cautious that, uh, that I want always to add, since, uh, I mean, their paper is clear, but uh, there has been some misinterpretation sometimes. Uh, this has nothing to do with the bird being uh, near a critical point where there is an order to disorder transition. The birds actually are highly ordered in these flocks. Okay? The fluctuation from order are extremely small. But this is just a consequence of this spontaneous symmetry breaking, which applies to the entire phase of collective motion. So you don't need to be close to a transition. You can be terribly ordered with very small fluctuation, and you still will see this kind of orientation fluctuation. Okay, then there is something over about the speed uh, 
scale-free part, but this is not pertaining to, to this talk, but and doesn't have to do with uh, order disorder, critical point in the sense of phase transition. Okay. Uh, velocity correlation, now, this consequence also means, I mean, this kind of property also means that uh, if you go to Fourier space, uh, and this is something you already saw with Andrea Cavagna Stoke, Fourier space for a number of reasons is more practical. It's also a little bit technical, but, but basically makes it extremely easy to uh, compute correlation function in Fourier space. Since basically what you have to do is just this operation. You have to take uh, here RJ, all the position of your particles in a certain snapshot. You test Q represent wave numbers. Okay, it's, it's a vector in Fourier space. You just have to take a different Q, typically small, approaching the inverse of the system size, and compute the sum where you take the exponential of this complex number, which is the product between the Q and the position of the births. You take the sum over all the births, then you take the modulo square of this number. Reasonable is simple. You take an average, if you can, over a few different snapshots. Et voila, and you have basically your Fourier transformer correlation function. Okay? And this is something which is rather simple to, to, to compute. Now, this uh, Fourier transform correlation function has some peculiarity, like it's different in different directions, if you look in different directions in Fourier space. This is terribly complicated to measure, even in numerical simulation, and I don't think it's simply accessible in experiments. But what you can do, you can average overall direction. Okay? This improves your statistics and basically leaves you with the essential behavior of this object, which is it is diverging with a certain exponent sigma as you go to smaller and smaller wavelength. Okay? And I'm going to show you in a, in a moment what it's doing. And actually, under some hypothesis, this toner and theory tells you also which is the value of this exponent or which is diverging, okay? There is a, a precise number, but this is not important for the criteria I'm going to show you. It's of interest for physicists, but it's not essential to discriminate between uh, directed and spontaneous collective motion. Okay, and another consequence you have already seen uh, uh, today in your talk on bacteria is that this system are extremely sensitive, to, I mean, they have extremely large fluctuation in the local density, okay? And uh, that's it. This has been actually measured, for instance, this kind of things in a totally different system, which is a system of epithelial cells. We have measured with, I mean, uh, actually this epithelial cells, let's see, okay. When they express uh, this protein here, and uh, you have seen this in the talk of Christina Marchetti, also, they basically have a transition to collective motion, which apparently is spontaneous since when you go to measure this structure factor introduced before in density, at small q, you exactly find this kind of divergence, okay? This is not uh, extremely extended uh, data, which is due to the fact that we could, for the moment, only measure this on relatively small system of a few thousand cells, but uh, now we are trying to extend this, but in principle, this thing should go growing uh, and diverging in zero as, uh, as long as, uh, as you increase the size of your system, which means you're exploring smaller and smaller frequencies, okay? And also, this other property, which is connected to this one, which is that fluctuations are extremely large. It means that if you go and measure for different sizes for the box in your system, the average number of particles and the fluctuation of this average, these fluctuations are extremely large, are larger than the square root of the number of, of, the number of particles, which is what you expect in systems which behave better, which don't do spontaneous collective motion. Okay, and again, this is uh, experimental data in this cell, epithelial cell system, and this dashed line is the theory. Okay, so basically you have this kind of properties in this system. This is spontaneous collective motion. Okay, I spare some details. Now, we go to see what happens when the collective motion is not spontaneous, but on top of this particle, we choose a direction, there is a preferred direction in space. 
And to do this, I put this kind of field H. To exemplify, I choose a V-check model, and I put an external field of amplitude H and a certain direction, constant, which tells all my particles, yes, this direction is slightly better than the others, okay? And so basically, I'm pulling, in a sense, I'm telling, go that way. Uh, before I anticipate the result of the theory, then I don't think I will have the time to enter into the details, but the results are the following. What I told you so far about these uh, long-range correlation, this divergence, etc., is no longer true. And actually, I'm introducing a cutoff in my system. So if I look in real space, I introduce a cutoff length, which depends on my field. Above which, okay, this cutoff length depends on one over my field to a certain power. Certain power can be computed, but this is, again, not so important. And this telling me that my correlation are long-ranged up to this length. And then, poof, they die, okay? Since at that length, the system realizes, the fluctuation of the system realizes that they are not spontaneous, but there is some kind of overall direction. The larger is the field, so the stronger I'm pulling my system, the earlier this cutoff happens. Okay, that's the idea. So this is something very clear. If you go to Fourier space, uh, it's even simpler since uh, a certain point uh, when, when my Q became small enough, uh, my divergence uh, is cut off. Uh, and instead of growing uh, as the wave number Q goes to zero, my system is going to go to a constant value. Okay, so there is a length scale, or the inverse of a length scale in Fourier space, after which all that I told you doesn't apply anymore and my system behaves decently, okay? And actually, one can work out uh, uh, the expression, a leading order in Q and in the external field amplitude H for this structure factor, okay? So before I had a divergence like one over Q to some exponent, this is just a prefactor which depends on all the details of my system and not going to enter too much into that, but now there is this correction, which is linear in the field, which tells me basically that uh, when Q became very, very small and H is much larger than Q, this thing doesn't, doesn't diverge anymore, but is stopped at a certain limit, one over H, okay? I don't, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, yeah, until 48. 48, so, okay, I, maybe I, I can just give a flavor of uh, how this thing is computed. So this is a hydrodynamic equation of Toner into theory. So the idea, as I told you, is very similar to what you do in, um, in Navier, when you describe a fluid with Navier-Stokes. You basically find the important field of your problem, which are connected uh, uh, basically to symmetry and conservation law. So in this case, you have the density, since your particles are conserved, at least on the time scales of the problem. So the number of particles you have doesn't change. And then uh, you have the local average velocity, since the essence of what your system is doing uh, is uh, breaking the invariance of all the direction in space and picking one. So there is a breaking of the symmetry in your system. So this is should be descriptive by a vector which tells you where you're going. So these are, sorry, the slow field of your theory. And then you basically write this kind of partial differential equation, which includes, uh, Okay, this is, can, can look a little bit uh, curious, but uh, it basically includes all the possible derivatives to the lowest order, which uh, are compatible with the symmetries of a problem. Okay, basically. So you put everything. So if there is not a strong reason not to put a term in this equation, you put the term. That's basically the idea. Okay? And then you, you, you can look, so actually these are all advective terms. Uh, these are all diffuse viscous term. Uh, there is a noise source since you want fluctuation in your system. There is a pressure which is here. And there is this magic term which you already seen, which is exactly the term which locally breaks the continuous symmetry and tells uh, this velocity field uh, to be non-zero, to be a value here, which is V0, which is non-zero. Okay, and this is basically the original theory of tunneling two. Uh, yeah, and there is a pressure which is here. I don't know if, yeah, this term here. 
And what we do is just to add this external field. I mean, it's nothing particularly fancy. You add this external field, and uh, you can go on. Now you consider the fluctuation in your system, so small changes with respect to the average velocity and the average density of your system. So you just see what happens if you put small fluctuation in your system. You work out a horrible equation which came from the previous one, but this can be done, and you go on, you go to Fourier space, which is a standard technique, you linearize this equation. So you just consider at the beginning very small fluctuations and you discard everything which is higher. And basically at this point becomes uh, a problem of linear algebra, even if a little bit annoying. And you, this leads you to compute uh, the structure factor in Fourier space, uh, at least to leading order in uh, the, so for small wave number, and uh, for small external field. Uh, now, okay, technically you have to integrate over this uh, time frequency to get the equal time structure factor. You do all your calculation and you get this result here, essentially. So this is a prefactor, which I hope is correct. This is, should be. And then this is this behavior you saw. There is this one over Q to some power, the prefactor, and your field, which acts as a cutoff. Okay? The only thing is that here you have an exponent 2, which is what you get out of linear theory. Remember, I basically said I consider all small fluctuations. Now, the original equation, if you go back and look at also nonlinearities, and this becomes a little less trivial to, to take into account, and you can use basically dynamical renormalization group arguments, which is what also Andrea Cavagna talked about the other day, and there are basically a number of arguments to conjecture that to a certain degree that this exponent from being a Q square became a QZ, okay? And this is what gives you this characteristic, characteristic length scale I, I show you before in the results. Okay, and so you get basically this kind of final result. You also average in all the direction, as I told you, to simplify your life, and you get this is the final result. Now we are going to test. So you can test in numerical simulation, this kind of thing to start with. I took again the Dicek model I showed you before with an external field. And uh, what do you see here? There are a lot of curves. Here is my structure factor. Here I have like, this wave number I told you. So I measure a smaller and smaller wave, num wave numbers, this correlation function in Fourier. And I have a different value of this external field. They are pretty small compared to the interaction, but they already do the job. And you see, if they don't have an external field, these things diverge, like 1 over q to the z, which is this line. And the black dots seem to diverge. As soon as I put even a small, very small value of h, at a certain point, this term here became small, and this dominates, and so tends to have my system converge. Okay? So basically, my, my, my structure factor converged to a finite number. Basically, the message is, if you look at this thing, this quantity, in experimental data, you should be able, okay, now this is a very extreme case where I have an extremely small external field, but look, I don't know, at this purple curve, which is still a very small, it's one hundredth of the interaction between particles, the effect of the external field. But you see that the purple line very clearly turns and doesn't grow anymore, okay? While the black line, which is spontaneous motion, grows indefinitely. So basically, if you're able to measure up to these uh, small frequency, which means up to these large sizes, you will see a clear difference in the fluctuation correlation. And you can say, ha, huh, this is uh, directed motion, okay? Then uh, you can test uh, the value of exponents by doing some rescaling, uh, and more details, which are more for physics, you, you can check that the renormalized theory works better than the original linear theory before doing RG. You can actually check, uh, which is, see, this is simpler, just taking the value of the, of the structure factor for Q going to zero, so you put this term to zero, that what is left uh, exactly scales like uh, one over H. And this is actually verified very neatly. In the structure factor, you can 
look uh, again at the giant number fluctuation, which also the general fluctuation get cut off. If you take a box which is large enough at a certain point, uh, they stop fluctuating in an anomalous way, the number of particles in the box. Since exactly the box became larger than this cutoff length introduced by the external field, uh, you see that uh, the fluctuation becomes normal. Okay, so this is possibly another way of measuring this kind of directed motion, but they are strongly correlated. Okay. Uh, okay, this is a small detour. There are other predictions which came out of this theory, which basically tells you how the order parameter is going uh, to change uh, when you apply an external field. The external field promotes to a certain extent order, and this is telling you, this theory can also tell you how the order parameter change uh, thanks uh, to the applied uh, external field. Uh, this is basically what defines the susceptibility in physics. And just adding this slide, okay, the susceptibility is diverging uh, in the thermodynamic limit, uh, exactly as another consequence of this spontaneous symmetry breaking. And uh, I'm just adding, since recently, the nice bartolo group uh, actually uh, happened to measure uh, in, a, in a system of uh, self-propelled colloids submitted to an external flow, which plays the role of this external field H, had some measure of this uh, response of the order parameter of the system to the external field, which are compatible with our theory which predicts initially some kind of linear increase of the order parameter and after a certain value of the external field which depends on the system size, uh, a growth with the exponent one third. So there is, this is already an experimental verification of another aspect of this theory. And uh, the last thing I wanted to show you I don't have an experiment, as I told you. And, and, and an obvious objection of what I show you so far is you showed us the Vichek model. The Vichek model, in a sense, is a wonderful model, but it's a little bit dull. Particle just orient one with each other. There is no steric repulsion. There is no, I mean, the, the model is fully compressible. So if you want to sell this to people interested in to cell migration, cells are not like uh, Dichuk particle cells occupy volume. They actually, the kind of epithelial cells uh, uh, also Christina discussed, are at the confluent uh, limit where the pecking fraction is one or even slightly larger than one. So can you still detect density fluctuations and uh, correlation of density in this kind of system? So we, I basically use the same model you, you've already seen in a few of these talks, which is, I like to call it collision and Vichuk model. Essentially, it's a Vichuk model where you also have steric repulsion. And uh, I added an external field. So not only my particle likes to go in the direction where they get pushed, and this is what does the spontaneous ordering, but also they have a direction which is better than the other, which is given by this angle theta h. So I'm just playing exactly the same game, but in a model which is a little bit richer. And this model actually has been shown to be able, if you tune the parameter smartly enough, to reproduce very closely the data of the cellular migration experiment I showed you at the beginning of my talk, okay? So the, the full dots are this model tuned, and uh, these uh, open dots is the experiment I showed you before. So I want to put myself in, 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 with a model which is reasonably close to an experiment in cellular migration and to see the same thing and basically this is what I got. Again, uh, here I have the structure factor. Here I have a case where my field uh, is zero. So the, the, the motion is totally spontaneous and I have this divergence as far as I like to go. And here I apply very small field. Here the smallness is compared to the interaction constant between different particles, essentially. So 10 to the minus uh, 2 and 2.5, 10 to the minus 2, very small values. But again, you can see that if you look at one of these curves, the green one, for instance, you see a clear movement towards a constant value. So this is a clear sign of directed motion, this is a clear sign of spontaneous motion. If you want, you can also divide by 
uh, sorry, this should be Q, not H. You can also divide by Q to this magic power Z. I show you, so in the case of spontaneous motion, you are flat, and in the case of directed motion, you decrease. This is, I don't know, depends on how you prefer to look at the data, basically. But, so the point is there is a qualitative difference between these two kinds of situation, collective motion and, uh, and uh, uh, directed motion. And I believe uh, that uh, it is possible to observe uh, in, uh, if you have large enough system, if you have a, lar a large enough number of particles to observe in real experiments. And it can be used to discriminate for wild beast cellular migration and fish and other groups uh, between uh, these two cases, okay? And, and, and the recipe is, is very simple. First of all, hope that your moving system is large enough. Otherwise, if you have 10 particles, that's not the, the idea for you. Then compute the structure factor, as I told you, and all you need to know is uh, the position of, the par of each particle, or of many of the particles. If you miss a few, it doesn't matter, since this is a statistical measure. So if you have a 10% loss of your particle, you can still survive. Now, check uh, the behavior of this quantity of locu. If it's diverging, you are spontaneous. If you are constant, you are driven. Okay, that's the basic idea. By the way, these also work, uh, all the results I told you also work if uh, your external field uh, only affects uh, a fraction of your particle. So if you have a 10% of informed uh, particle in your system, since they know where is the, the nest, uh, they know where they want to, to migrate, uh, all these results apply. It doesn't matter, okay? As long as you have a finite fraction of your particle which they know where they want to go, all I told you is true. So it's quite general. There is one word of advice. I'm still working on it. This is criteria. Maybe, uh, I mean, it is, the point is it could be that your system is not large enough to observe this kind of uh, um, saturation of the structure factor. So it could be that, that this, this, I mean, this tells you if you are directed. If you see a saturation and you're moving, you're clearly directed. Uh, it could be that if you see something which looks spontaneous, uh, it's just uh, since uh, you are not looking at a large enough system. So if you have a very, very tiny preference for the direction, maybe you need a larger system to detect. So we cannot exclude uh, um, directed motion with this method in principle, but uh, uh, we can confirm it. If we see this kind of saturation and the thing is moving, that is going to be directed motion. There is no doubt that the thing is not spontaneous. Least but not last, uh, what we would like to do next, uh, and I would like to do this with the group of Roberto Cerbino in Milano, is to try a controlled experiment. Of course, one could apply to a case where you know that there is chemiotaxis, but an idea is uh, to have uh, one of these cellular migration experiment on some uh, micro-graded substrate. So basically, the idea is to take the substrate over which these cells are crawling and uh, scratch it with parallel lines. And the cells uh, should be encouraged by this way to follow the parallel lines. So we, we are introducing a preferred direction in our system. And we believe that uh, in this case, we should observe the signature of directed motion. So this is what we would like if we get some foundings in the next months. And, uh, and that is basically the conclusion of my talk. I have to thank my group in Aberdeen. The black people is the people who collaborated to this kind of project. And these are my external collaborators, the people in Milano and John Toner in Oregon. Thank you.